needed another successful product. Jobs thought he had it in a powerful business computer called the Lisa. But the Apple board of directors still questioned his leadership and refused to give him the project. Steve expected it to be his. You know, it was his idea. We're going to do it. It's going to be mine. And they said, no, don't think so. By 1981, Steve Jobs was taken off Apple Computer's Lisa project. Steve was used to succeeding. Being uh, turned down to be the head of the Lisa division was his first personal failure. Even though he was chairman of the board and co-founder of the company, they said he wasn't experienced enough to run the Lisa team. And so he was unhappy about that. Jobs threw himself into another project, a computer created by Apple employee Jeff Raskin that would use similar technology, but be available to consumers at a much lower price. He felt this would break open the market. Or rather, to characterize Steve's brain properly, or rather, the market ought to break open, you know, if the market had any sense. The project was named the Macintosh. He set up shop in an outlying building in the Apple complex and took a small team of Apple's best engineers with him. There was a black pirate flag flying on a mast on the front of the building. And this signified what Steve said was, we're the pirates and the Lisa team uh, were the Navy. Also during this time, the 29-year-old Jobs bought an historic mansion in pricey Woodside, California. The 17,000-foot Spanish mansion was considered by some in town to be a cultural landmark. He lived there as a kind of weird hermit recluse while developing the Mac, and it was famous for being um, completely empty of furniture. He slept on a bare mattress on the floor. Jobs' obsession was the Macintosh, and his intense drive began to take its toll on the Mac team. He was just impossible to work with. He just scared the bejesus out of people and wouldn't accept anything but the most amazing breakthroughs, which is impossible to deliver on a day-to-day -day basis. His standards just got higher and higher and higher. And uh, people would bring him work to look at. It would be 1 o'clock in the, in the morning. Sometimes Steve said, I'm not even going to look at it. And they said, well, Steve, I've worked on this thing for 25 hours. And he said, I know, but it's not good enough. You know, go back and work on it some more. Some of them just wound up... Um just quitting in disgust. Some of them wound up saying they'd never work for Steve again. They just couldn't. When the exhausted team finished, they had a revolutionary new computer. Many of us have been working on Macintosh for over two years now, and it has turned out insanely great. Guy Kawasaki was the software evangelist on the original Mac and is now a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and venture capitalist. In like 60 seconds after I saw the demo of Macintosh, it was so cool. Angels started to sing. I mean, it was a beautiful experience. When you saw Macintosh for the first time, you have to put yourself back. It's 25 years ago now. That was a religious experience. This was supposed to be the computer that tamed the complexity of everything associated with the world of computing to make it available, as Steve would say, for mere mortals. It was a giant step into the future. It was extraordinary. What it wasn't was particularly useful, <laughs> but that didn't matter. The computer was beautiful, but had limited functionality. For the Macintosh to succeed, Jobs needed great software. He turned to another industry prodigy, Bill Gates. In the lead up to the Mac launch, the two pioneers appeared together at an Apple event. Microsoft had been writing software for the Mac for two years. Jobs didn't know that down the road, Bill Gates would become his main rival. For Jobs, the enemy was IBM and a PC that was taking over the market. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? Was George Orwell right? Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary. Jobs, the underdog, took aim at the giant with a spellbinding commercial. Everybody who was around at the time remembers the most memorable moment of the launch of the Macintosh, being the Ridley Scott commercial. There was this dark Orwellian vision of the future. It aired nationally only once 
on Super Bowl Sunday in January of 1984, but the impact was explosive. We estimated we got $45 million of free publicity of it being run over and over again by television networks all over the world because no one had ever seen a commercial like this before. I think everybody at the company was hoping and praying fervently that it would be a game changer. But it was dismissed by the high priests of computing as little more than a toy. And I think the sentiment within a year or so of the launch had turned very negative uh, about Apple and its future. In 1984, Steve Jobs and Apple Computer hoped the Macintosh would live up to its hype, but sales were a disappointment, and the IBM PC and PC-compatible computers still dominated the market. Internally, trouble was brewing at Apple Computer. He ran a muck at Apple. He cost the company a lot of money. So Steve was considered to be wasteful, he was considered to be self-indulgent, he was the largest shareholder, but also a kind of a brat. The thinking was, well, Macintosh had not penetrated business, we need a more mature leadership, some adult supervision to run the company. Tension in the company rose as an internal power struggle threatened to tear it apart. I said, Steve, we're a public company, and I have to tell the board where we are in terms of inventory, in terms of sales performance, and we're in trouble. And the trouble is in the Macintosh division. And he said, I don't believe you're going to do that. I don't think you have the nerve to do that. When he had reached the point where he identified Scully as a rival, he decided he had to take Scully out. So he engineered a boardroom confrontation where it's him or me. And much to Steve's surprise, the board sided with Scully. They said, Steve, we want your assurance that you're not going to leave Apple and take other people with us. We've heard rumors of that. And he said, no, absolutely not. And then the next day, Steve took five key managers and the board fired him. The knee-jerk reaction of conventional people is to elbow what they see as disruptive forces aside. And Steve, the co-founder of Apple, was unchivalrously ushered to the exit. Jobs was 30 years old. He sold all but one share of his Apple stock. For Steve, it was a, it was a statement. It's a vote of no confidence in the company. I'm out, therefore the company's going to fail. He being fired almost destroyed him. They threw him out of his own company. I mean, he thought it was unbelievable. Remember, Steve Jobs didn't just see himself as a business person. Uh, he saw himself as an artist. He saw himself as a revolutionary, someone who wanted to change the world. You know, I think there was a, a brief flirtation with the idea that Steve Jobs could go into politics, which, of course, looking back seems absurd because Steve Jobs is the, the least diplomatic person in the world. There were all kinds of uh, ideas, and it turned out that he wanted to go back and once again create the most insanely great computer in the world. Taking five top managers, in 1985, Jobs moved on to start a computer company called Next. For Jobs, it was about more than just creating a personal computer. It was about trying to reinvent the company. It was about creating the ideal work environment. It was about creating the ideal architectural environment. You know, Next had to be perfect in every way, something that would help change the world. Very modest ambitions. The product was powerful inside and out. A highly designed example of Jobs perfectionism. The next machine was was beautiful. It had this, you know, black design. It was kind of like, you know, Darth Vader's computer. But Jobs struggled to find a market for the expensive computer. It was only a matter of time before Next was in trouble. At the time, you know, it was this incredible workstation and it's going to be a high price point. But if anything, Next also shows that lots of things have to fall in place. But Jobs did refine a business strategy he would use again and again. He learned at Next that he got a lot more attention by being secretive than he did by being open. 
And frankly, he didn't 